welcome everybody. So today it's a great pleasure to have Benjamin Hoffman from Cornell and he'll be speaking on generalized golf and cycling systems. Great. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me to talk. Um, maybe to manage everyone's expectations. Anton wanted me to do a 90 minute talk, but uh, originally this was maybe 70 minutes. So we'll just see how, how long it takes. And if it ends early, that's plenty of time for questions. Um, so I'm gonna to talk today on, on a paper that Jeremy and I are finishing. So this is joint with uh, Jeremy Lane, who's a postdoc at McMaster in the Fields Institute. Um, so the outline of the talk is gonna be pretty straightforward. Um, I'll remind everyone what a Gelfand settling system is. Um, the goal is to give some general generalization of this. Um, so to do that, I'll uh, remind everyone what canonical bases are, um, then say what a generalized Gelfand settling system should be, and then show how to construct. Okay, so this is some really basic reminder of background. Um, so for a Lie group, I'll take the Lie algebra of the Lie group and little k star is gonna be a linear dual. So then there's a Poisson bracket on this. How you define the Poisson bracket on functions is you take, um, you take uh, elements of the Lie algebra. So thinking of those as functions on the dual space and how you define the bracket of these guys X and Y at a point Xi in the dual Lie algebra is you Lie bracket X and Y together and then you evaluate Xi. So that gives you a Poisson structure. It's called a linear Poisson structure on a uh, little k star. So the thing to know about this, or the first thing to know is that the symplectic leaves of this Poisson structure are the coadjoint orbits. So remember k acts on little k by the adjoint action, and then the dual action is the coadjoint action. The symplectic leaves are the, of this Poisson structure are precisely the orbits under this action of K. Um, so why you might care about this is, for instance, if you have a Hamiltonian K-manifold, so now here's M and omega is a symplectic form, mu is a moment map, then one way to phrase the moment map condition is to say that the moment map to little k star is a Poisson map. So if you care about Hamiltonian K-manifolds, you should care about these uh, linear Poisson manifolds. So now I'm gonna talk about a specific um, little k star. So for when k is the group of unitary matrices. Um, so I'm gonna identify for concreteness, I'll identify little un star with the set of n by n Hermitian matrices. So there's, um, there's a non-degenerate ad invariant um, symmetric bilinear form on little un. And I, so I can use that to identify it, little un with little un star. And then the Lie algebra of the unitary group is uh, skew Hermitian matrices. So if I just multiply that by I, it gives me Hermitian matrices. Okay, so I poured over the, the Poisson structure from little un star to the Hermitian matrices. Now I'm gonna define a bunch of functions on there. Um, so how I do that is as follows. So I'll take numbers i and j between one and n, and I'll define a function mu i j, which what it does is, so for, for m is an element of hn, so an n by n Hermitian matrix. I'll take the J by J submatrix of M, which is sitting in the upper left-hand corner of M. So this is, again, gonna be a Hermitian matrix, right? So it's equal to its own conjugate transpose. So Hermitian matrices have real eigenvalues, so I can extract all the eigenvalues and order them. And this function mu i j is then gonna return the ith largest eigenvalue of of that submatrix. Um, so in particular, if j is equal to n, then mu i n is just giving me 
the ith largest eigenvalue of um, of the matrix M. So uh, these functions are Casimirs of the Poisson structure. So if I fix if I fix all the eigenvalues of a matrix, that's telling me what orbit it's in under conjugation by the unitary group. So that's telling me, if you translate this back into little un star, that's telling me which co-adjoint orbits it, orbit it is in. So here are some properties of this map that I've built. Um, so I can put all the mu ij's together into a map from the set of permission matrices into r to the n times n plus 1 over 2. That's just how many functions I had. So this is going to be smooth on an open dense subset. So when the, when the eigenvalues coincide, this, this function will um, fail to be smooth. It'll still be continuous, but it won't be smooth. But if I just look at where all the eigenvalues are pairwise distinct, um, then this will actually be a smooth function. Um, okay, so now I can take the Hamiltonian vector fields. So where I plug in, I plug in the component functions mu i j, mu i prime j prime into my Poisson bracket. So this is now a derivation on the ring of smooth functions of um, of HN. So this is a vector field on HN. And it turns out that these vector fields commute for any choice of i and j that I put in. And more than that, they actually descend. So I said they descend to an effective torus action on the smooth locus of mu. So they descend to a torus action. These flows are periodic. And then, um, so I've lost some number of dimensions when I, when I go to n minus one here, um, which is going to make my action effective. So basically, some of these mu ij's, in particular these mu in's, are going to just give you the zero vector field, these are, since these are the Casimir functions. Um, but once I get rid of those guys, then I'll have a uh, effective torus action. So then if I, if I restrict my attention to, say, like a generic symplectic leaf of HN, um, so this is going to be a, an orbit through, through um, a diagonal matrix where all the eigenvalues are, are distinct. Um, this will be a symplectic manifold, and the dimension of this torus here will be half the dimension of that symplectic manifold. So this gives you a completely integrable system um, on an open end subset of that symplectic leaf. So there's some places where the, the Hamiltonian is going to be um, continuous, but not simple. Benjamin? Yep. But how is it? But this, uh, uh, the Gaussian Sachin write it, it works for all the orbits, right? Yeah, it does work for all the orbits. So I was trying to give a, a slightly simpler version. So um, if I pick a non-generic, um, say, say I take all the orbits through some open face of the positive vial chamber, this is going to be a Poisson sub-manifold. And um, I guess by quotienting out by enough uh, Sub, like a, a, a large enough subtorus, I'll get a completely integrable system on that Poisson submanifold and on, on the symplectic leaves in there. Um, so it'll just be a smaller dimensional torus. Okay, so yeah, and then this last, this last point is that I want to describe the moment map image of mu. Um, the moment map image is exactly going to be a polyhedral cone inside r to the n times n plus 1 over 2. And it's cut out by some of these inequalities, by all of these inequalities for uh, i and j, ranging all through, the, through all the possible values. These are called the interlacing inequalities. Um, the cone that uh, 
that is cut out by these inequalities is called the gelfand setlin cone. So putting together these last two bullet points basically justifies the name, the gelfand setlin integrable system. Um, okay, so what, what other integrable systems exist that are similar to this? So the original construction of this was by Gilliman and Sternberg. Um, they did it for unitary group and also orthogonal group. So the construction uses a, a chain of subalgebras. So for instance, in the orthogonal case, you can put O1 into O2, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up into ON. Um, and this, having a chain of subalgebras like this gives you basically by dualizing and taking the Casimirs of each subalgebra, um, this gives you enough Poisson commuting functions on, um, on ON star to give you a completely inerable system. Um, so the strategy won't work for something like SP2N since you can take SP2 includes into SP4, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you'll get some Poisson commuting functions, but not actually enough to give you a completely integrable system. Um, and this obviously also won't work for compact Lie algebras of exceptional type. Um, so there's, there's a generalization due to Megumi Harada, which she built um, a completely integrable system on SP2N star, um, where she basically took these commuting functions that you get from a chain of subalgebras and supplemented them with some additional functions, I think using uh, the twisted Yangian. Um, so this is some quantum groups argument that gives her more uh, functions on SP2N star. And then there's also this work of Harada and Kave in uh, 2015. So they built completely integrable systems on, not on all of little K star, so not on the entire dual of the, the, the Lie algebra, but on specific co-adjoint orbits inside the Lie algebra for um, an arbitrary compact Lie algebra. So specifically for the integral ones. Um, so the goal that I'm going to accomplish today is to give a generalization of the gelfand setlin system um, on the entire dual of the Lie algebra for any compact Lie group K. Um, so you could sort of think of this as accomplishing what Harada and Kave did um, on a specific co-adjoint orbit, but doing it for all the co-adjoint orbits simultaneously. And we're, we really use techniques that were originally developed by Harada and Kabe, but with some extra um, sort of difficulties involved. Um, okay. So now I'm going to talk about um, canonical bases and their parameterizations. So I'll fix some standard Lie theory notation. Um, so K is always going to be a compact Lie group. G will be its complex form. B and B minus are opposite Borel's. N and N minus are the maximal unipotent subgroups inside there. H will be the, the Carton subgroup. Uh, T is the maximal torus. Um, fracture letters will be uh, denote Lie algebras. P is going to be the set of weights of G, and then P plus is the set of dominant weights. A little T star plus is going to be the positive bile chamber. Okay, so that's standard. I can remind anyone if they forget. So it's a theorem of Lustig that there is a canonical basis of U n minus. So here, this is the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra of the minus unipotent sub subgroup. Um, so it's a basis as like a uh, as a vector space over C, 
and it's canonical in the sense that there's a construction that works for um, this construction works for um, reductive Lie groups generally. There's no specific choices that are made. Um, so really, this comes from quantum groups. So Lustig constructed originally for u q n minus, and then the canonical basis that you get here is when you specialize q is equal to one. But I'm not really going to deal with a quantum groups picture. Um, so I want to use this to build canonical bases of uh, irreducible G modules. So if I take lambda is a dominant integral weight of G, and I'll let V lambda is the irreducible G module with high weight lambda, and I'll fix a highest weight vector. So this is unique up to some scalar multiple. Um, and then I'll just see what happens when I act on V lambda with all the elements of the canonical basis of UN minus. So uh, most of these guys will be zero and the ones that are not zero will actually form a basis of V lambda and it'll be a weight basis. And actually what I'll be interested in is typically the dual basis for this. So this is the basis, the dual basis for this dual representation, V lambda star. Um. Benjamin? Yep. Maybe I can steal Alan Knudsen's question. How, how, how is it this, um, this uh, canonical basis, is it an orthogonal basis with respect to the invariant pairing on the representation? Um, yeah, so we talked about this this week. We're, mm -hmm. Alan told me that it's not an, uh, an orthogonal basis. I wasn't able to find a reference one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, basically, for our purposes, this doesn't matter. So there's a technique that using a, a valuation on um, on the algebra that we originally or uh, eventually end up looking at. So there's a way that we can sort of wrangle things to get an orthogonal basis. Um, once that becomes relevant. Um, I, can, I can say more about that once, once we get there, but mm -hmm. uh, I guess the answer to your question is, I don't know, Alan told me no, mm -hmm. um, but for our purposes, it doesn't end up actually mattering. Mm -hmm. okay, maybe, okay. maybe someone in the, in the audience is more an expert than I am. Well, Anyone wants to wants to make a comment about the canonical basis? All right, that's okay for now. Okay, no one knows. Um, okay, so parameterizations of canonical bases. So I want to um, describe these canonical bases in terms of lattice points of polytopes. So let me just define some notation or terminology. So I'll say a polyhedral parameterization of the canonical basis B lambda is just a bijection between B lambda and the set of lattice points in a convex polytope. And then what I'll actually be interested in is gonna be a, a parameterization of um, basically all the dual canonical bases, so all these B lambda stars at once. So for lambda ranging all over all the dominant weights. And this is, um, so I, I have these polytopes, uh, triangle lambda, and I just label them by the associated uh, weight. And I wanna enforce that this set is the set of lattice points of some convex polyhedral cone inside this space tensor with R. Um, so a first example is when G is GLNC, so the complex form of the uh, unitary group. So then the set of weights is uh, just um, n tuples of integers and a dominant weight can be identified with a list of uh, non-strictly decreasing integers. 
So then the gelfin setlin pattern associated to a lambda like this is just going to be the set of um, integers, lambda ij, which satisfy these interlacing inequalities. So this is going to be, you, we saw these interlacing inequalities before as um, the inequality is cutting out the moment map image. And now we take the integral points and for a fixed lambda, and these are, there's a bijection between these points and the canonical basis. Um, sorry, and uh, now those lambda with a low index n, that's, that's the string of lambdas that you, you have defined before, right? Those lambda one, lambda two, and yeah, so yeah. on. Yeah, 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 I, I guess I, uh, yeah, yeah. So if I put a little, a lower index n here, that's basically fixing the upper row of the gelfand settlement pattern. Um, but really, I'm going to let lambda let lambda vary over all its possible values. So the gelfand settlement cone here, I'm letting lambda vary, and then I'm taking the associated polytope. So then you can really see that. Uh, the gelfand settlin cone is cut out by just these inequalities where now I'm letting lambda range over all the possible values. Okay. Um, so there's, there's some version of this for, or something like this, for an arbitrary reductive group. Um, so these are called the string parameterizations. Um, so I'm going to fix boldface i, which is a reduced expression for the longest element of the vial group of G. So in terms of simple reflections, where these i1 through im are associated with uh, the simple roots. So there's a polyhedral parameterization, call it triangle lambda i, of the dual canonical basis, which depends only on the choice of i. And I'll say a little bit more what that is in a, in a minute. Um, so these guys are called the string, string polytopes. Um, this was defined by Berenstein Zelovinsky. And then if you put together all the string polytopes and label them by their associated weights, these guys go into a cone. I'll call it the extended string cone. Um, and this is the set of integral points in a convex polyhedral cone. Um, so this was shown by Littleman. I think that if you want to know that, like the specific inequalities that cut out this cone, this is also in the paper by Berenstein Zelovinsky. Um, okay, so how the string parameterizations look. So if I fix a dominant weight and I consider an element inside the dual canonical basis, I want to associate it with um, a a lattice point. And how I do that is inductively. So here these FIs are going to be the, um, the weight vectors um, associated with a weight minus alpha I1. Um, and I want to see basically, I'm going to act with this weight vector some number of times on the dual canonical basis element. And see how far I can go with that before I start getting zero. And that'll tell me how that number of times that I can do that will give me my first integer. So I, I walk that far and then I see how far I can act with um, the weight vector of weight minus alpha I2, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I inductively get this list of integers, um, V1 through Vn. And so this is actually giving me a, a bijection between um, these dual canonical basis elements and some set of um, lattice points. And these lattice points are sitting inside a polytope, which is the string polytope. So to be even more explicit about it, um, I computed for SL3 how this looks. So um, 
Here I'm gonna give actually in the entire extended string cone. So my choice of reduced word is I is one, two, one. Um, so I'll, I'll describe the string cone in terms of some uh, parameterization by six natural numbers. And how the parameterization looks is I map it down into here. So this is, looks like n to the five. Um, and how the map goes is like this. And so these first two numbers, you should think of this as this is the, um, so lambda you can write as a sum of uh, some natural number times omega one, the first fundamental weight, and then omega two, the second fundamental weight. This is the coefficient of the first fundamental weight and the second fundamental weight. And then the, the natural numbers you can put here are the, the lattice points inside that associated string polytope. Okay, so I mentioned this because it'll be important later. It'll also be important to know um, how the semi-group algebra of this guy looks. So uh, this map has some kernel, which is you can just check directly that the kernel of the map is this. So um, if you want to form the semi-group algebra of CI, it's the algebra in six, gen six generators subject to this relation. Benjamin, a quick question yeah. about the semi-group. I don't know if it's important, but is this a saturated semi-group? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that's um, a consequence of this theorem of Littleman, that it's an inter set of integral points of a convex polyhedral cone. So I think, oh, any, I see. yeah, mm -hmm. I think yes. that it's automatically saturated. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? Shall I keep going? I don't have a watch. I think. Uh, oh yeah, we still have plenty of time. Okay. No, we, we can. Yeah, and then then we'll see if you do fit in six. If, if it looks or not, depending on the progress. Sounds great. Okay, oh. I'll keep going. Okay, so generalized gelfand setland systems. This will be the goal. Um, so. We saw for the original gelfand setland system, the moment map image um, of little un star is this, the real points or the real span of the, the gelfand setland cone. So this was this collection of gelfand setland patterns. Um, and then the integral points of this gelfand setland cone parameterize the dual canonical bases of all the GLN modules, basically at once. So here's the problem statement. So I wanna take K as the Lie algebra of a compact Lie group, and um, C is some polyhedral parameterization of um, all the dual canonical bases. And the, Goal is to find a proper continuous map, so a moment map mu from little k star to rn, which satisfies the following. So, okay, so for each open face of the positive vial chamber, um, I can take the k orbits through points in this open face, and this will be a Poisson submanifold of the dual Lie algebra little k star. And I want that the map mu is smooth on an open dense subset of this Poisson manifold. Um, the second thing that I want to satisfy is that I want that on its smooth locus, that this map generates a completely inerogable torus action. And then the third thing is that I want that the moment map image of little k star is the the real span of this cone um, C. 
are the real points of this code. So there's the, the theorem that I'll talk about, how to prove, is that for all compact Lie groups K and all string parameterizations, a map like this exists. And I'll say explicitly how to construct this map. Um, so I should say that talking about string parameterizations is probably an over-specialization. So there's polyhedral parameterizations um, coming from uh, the theory of cluster algebras, which are more general than just these string parameterizations. Um, in particular, there's a, a recent preprint of, uh, I think, Fujita and Oya, where they construct some some valuations, um, which give you different semigroup algebras, which are different semigroups, um, which are different polyhedral parameterizations of these um, dual canonical bases. But we've sort of just, I'll, I'll just talk about the, the string parameterizations today, since that's, I guess, the most developed in the literature. Okay, so now I'll talk about how to do this construction. Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, just this, uh, uh, well, this map depends on I, on both face I, or? Yes, yes. This, mm -hmm. And you know how to, how, well, what's the relation between these maps for different I's? Um, that's a good question. Okay, we can discuss. I don't. Later. Yeah, it's I don't. Not, I don't think that we obvious, actually. Know. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the map is defined as some like time one flow of some vector field, so it's it's actually hard to describe the map explicitly. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, you can say that the you can describe um, transformations between the moment map images, um, which are these piecewise linear. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, transformations, but in terms of the maps themselves, I think that would maybe be hard, but it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. so in particular, the maps for different eyes are not a composition, or let's say a map from I prime is not a composition of a map for I and the piecewise linear transformation defined by the words I and I prime. Um, I, I don't want to say definitively that it's not that, um, mm -hmm. but it's not not obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll tell you how the construction goes and then you can tell me if it looks obvious. Um, but yeah, that is an interesting question. Okay, so um, let me just double check the time. Okay, so it looks like we'll either go over time or under time on the 90 minute. So it goes. I'll just talk for another 10 minutes and then we can take a pause. So here's the outline of the proof is, um, there's basically three main ideas, um, which are taking results of other people and sort of chaining them together. And then there's some like, commutative algebra and analysis that we have to do at one point. Um, the outline is like this. So first we're gonna pass to a stratified space, which is the, it's called the symplectic implosion of the cotangent bundle of K, which is a symplectic realization of sorts of little K star. Um, so it's a stratified space, which is piecewise a symplectic manifold, and each of these symplectic manifolds has a submersion down to a, a Poisson submanifold, little k star. Um, the next step is to identify this imploded cotangent bundle with an affine variety, which is the base affine space, g mod n. Um, then we take a toric degeneration of g mod n to the toric variety of the extended string cone. And then we use a gradient Hamiltonian flow, 
which builds a continuous map from gmod n to the historic variety, which is dense on an uh, or which is smooth on an open dense subset. And then finally, we compose with a moment map for the torus, the compact torus action on this toric variety, um, and then divide by a residual small torus action to get a moment map out of little k star. Okay, so now I'm going to go through this construction in much detail. So the first step is to pass to this imploded cotangent bundle. So this is a, a space which was constructed by Gilliman, Jeffrey, and Schmar. Um, as a set, how this looks is it's a disjoint union of pieces. So here sigma is an open face of the positive vial chamber. And it's direct product with k divided by the commutator of the um, stabilizer subgroup of this face. So there's a topology on this guy. Um, and each piece of the, the um, of the stratified space is a smooth symplectic manifold. Um, and then there's a proper map down from the imploded space to little k star, which is really a moment map for a residual k action on this guy. Um, and it's a, it's a Poisson map in, on each symplectic uh, manifold, which is a, making up a stratum of this imploded space. So it's essentially Poisson, as long as that makes sense. Um. I, I, I kind of forgot, but how, how is it? This guy also has this steam torus action or, or not? I, I don't quite. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so there's an action on the left by, uh, by K and also there's a, a Tim torus action on the right. Um, I'll say in a minute how that looks in terms of an embedding. So, right, so now I want to identify this guy with an affine variety, which is this base affine space. So this will take a little bit because um, I want to do it embedded inside. I some... found a few bed and breakfast near you. The first one is bed, bath, and beyond at 131. Fairgrounds oh, no. Memorial Park. Sorry, Google's talking to me. The second one is Fountain Place at 2000 Place, Ithaca. Um, okay, so... Uh, I don't know how Google got that. Um, okay, so I want to fix a string parameterization of all these dual canonical bases. So um, this is a semigroup, and I want to take some subset, call it pi, of dominant weights, which is finite, and which so that these the string polytopes associated with pi generate this extended string cone as a semi-group. Um, so, sorry, maybe again taking up the question, I, I forgot where was it your question last time? The kind of, uh, so assuming that G is simply connected, we can simply take fundamental baits, right? Because it's, it sounds a little bit confusing, this choice that you um, made. Yeah, it's if G is simply connected, you can take fundamental weights. Um, you can also take more if you so desire. Basically, we're we're doing this so we don't have to deal with describing the generating subset of the extended string pin. But as far as I know, it is generated by the these polytopes associated with fundamental weights. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, basically we didn't need to to do this, so I didn't bother to check this fact, but I think that's true. Um, yeah, so, okay, so you could think of pi as being the set of fundamental weights. E is the direct sum of all the V lambdas. So this is a G module. Um, so for example, if G is SL3, then um, 
I just take pi as the two fundamental weights and E is just this six dimensional G module, which is the direct sum of these two guys. All right, so coordinate algebra of G, um, as a, so there's, a, there's an action of G cross G um, on this, which is on the left and on the right, and these two actions commute. Um, so as a G cross G module, you can write coordinate algebra of G as direct sum over all the, fundam as over all the dominant weights of V lambda, tensor V lambda star. I want to take the n invariance of this, where n is embedded in the right-hand copy of g. So the n invariance of this is just v lambda star tensor the one-dimensional space spanned by the um, highest weight vector. And so you can identify this with just direct sum of, of v lambda stars, where lambda is ranging over all the dominant weights. Um, so then this collection of all the dual canonical bases forms a, a basis for this ring of n invariants. So I'm going to take g mod mod n, which is the affine variety associated with this ring. Um, if I just look at the, so there's a, a vector subspace of uh, the ring of n invariants, which is just these guys where lambda is sitting inside pi. This forms a generating subset for this ring as a ring, um, which duly gives you a G equivariant embedding of G mod n into this vector space E that I gave on the previous slide. So I'm gonna think of the base affine space G mod n as being a affine variety embedded inside this vector space E. Okay, so how this looks um, explicitly in an example. Um, so continuing the example from before, um, the ring of n invariants for G um, when G is SL3 looks like this. So this is functions in six variables. So you could think of these as being um, minors, which are minors on three by three matrices sitting up on the left-hand column of, or, or the pushed over to the left-hand side of the matrix. So this is like the minor one, one, this is the minor two, one, minor three, one, this is the one, two, one, two minor, et cetera. And then these functions satisfy this Pluca relation here. Um, okay, so if I identify this fundamental weight module with, uh, or the, right, this fundamental weight module, the functions on that with polynomials in these three variables, and functions on this other fundamental weight module with functions in these three variables. This gives me an embedding of G mod N into um, the direct sum of these two guys. So to be more explicit about how this dual canonical basis looks is um, in terms of elements of this ring of N invariants, it's gonna be the set of monomials in um, these six, six functions, um, which aren't divisible by Z2, Z13. So you could think of this Pluca relation as saying, if I have a monomial which does, which is divisible by Z2, Z13, then this relation tells you how to rewrite it as a linear combination of monomials which aren't. So this is like quite explicit in this case of SL3. So, so, so sorry, say again, so the dual, the, the, the dual bases, which are, these are things which are not divisible by Z2, Z1, 3, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so w w w why is that again? Um, 
Well, that, that's just a choice, right? So here you have a quotient, and you 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 want you. So th this this chooses you. Is, th this is a choice of a section, right? So it's a kind of normal form. Um, or what? Why, why, why is it like that? I don't know if there's. I mean, once I've once I've been like written down generators for um, this algebra and this form. I don't know if there's any choice being made. Uh, no, but I mean, you, you chose this Z2, Z1, 3. You, you could have chosen any other of, of for instance, Z1. Yeah, 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 this is true. Right. Um, and they may, or maybe there are many, many other choices. These are the choices that, uh, that, that are just obvious, but how? We've also chosen the longest word, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure, to start with. But even, yeah. even now, now, now we have this description as a quotient of the polynomial algebra by that one relation, but... Uh, yeah, well. yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Okay, so if I want to write down it as a polynomial algebra, then I do need to make a choice of mm -hmm. generators. So uh, it, this doesn't depend on a choice of longest word. So the longest word affects the parameterization that I take, but the dual canonical basis is independent of that parameterization. No, but we, but you know, you know, but for the statement to make sense, we do need a parameterization, right? So, in the end, the, the, the statement does depend on the parameterization. In the end, the statement that I'm going to prove depends on a parameterization. But the, the statement, the dual canonical basis of, of this guy, is yeah. the set of monomials. This doesn't depend on any choice of longest, longest word. Uh, or that. Well, here I'm, I'm kind of confused because those, uh, uh, oh, okay, okay, yes, that's right, thanks. Yeah, I mean, everything I did in these three slides, there was no mm -hmm. words or yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah, okay, yes. Yeah, okay. Right, okay, so um, I want to do a symplectic geometry. So to do that, I'm going to give this vector space E a K invariant Hermitian form. Um, so this makes E into a Kähler manifold. Um, sorry, Benjamin, just, just, yeah. just one question. So I guess, yes. so now how do you estimate what's the remaining length of the talk? I estimate probably 20 minutes. But then, you know, I suggest maybe we, we just, maybe you, you, you were right, maybe we should just, so it's going to be more than 60 minutes, but it's consider considerably less than 90. Maybe we don't make a break. Is it okay for everybody? That sounds good to me. Okay, so yeah, let's just continue. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I've given E a Kähler form. This is the Kähler form. It's minus the imaginary part of this Hermitian form. Um, so then it's a theorem of Gilliam and Jeffrey Schmar, and then slightly generalized by Hilgert, Mannon, and Martins, um, that this imploded cotangent bundle is isomorphic to G mod N, equipped, so as, um, so I'm thinking of G mod N as embedded inside E, and so on each of its, uh, on each of its strata, I can equip it with a restriction of this um, ambient Kähler form. And so I make the, the smooth pieces of this guy into Kähler manifolds. And then um, the imploded cotangent bundle is going to be isomorphic as a Hamiltonian K space to G mod N. Right, so something that'll be important as a tool in what's going to come up is that um, there's this proper moment map that also exists on G mod N. Um, so how it looks is like this. So E is, it's a Hamiltonian um, K times T space. So now I'm just looking at K sitting inside the the group G, which is acting on E diagonally. Um, I also have this 
uh, extra torus action. So how the torus acts is it acts with weight minus lambda on each direct summand v lambda. Um, so then how this extra t it ha looks is it has a moment map. Um, I'll call it the high weight map because it's some, I guess, geometric version of the map extracting the highest weight of a uh, irreducible representation. So what the high weight map does is it goes down to the positive file chamber. If you have a sum of elements u lambda, where each u lambda is sitting inside one of these direct sum ends, v lambda, it's going to take pi times uh, norm squared of u lambda multiplied by the associated weight. So this gives you a point in the positive file chamber. Sorry, pi is just the number pi? Just or? the number pi. Oh, is it just because yeah. like minimalization is not chosen in a good way or <laughs> why? Yeah, <not>? probably. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so key fact that'll come up later is that this map HW high weight is a proper map. Um, so this is just clear from looking at the description of it. Um, it's also important just describing the geometry of the stratification of this um, imploded space. So I'm gonna think of this imploded space now as living inside E um, via this theorem that I stated on the previous slide. So remember that I said that as a set, it looks like this. So it's uh, open face of the positive vial chamber times um, some quotient of K. Um, so each of these guys is a stratum of the imploded space. And under the embedding, this strata, stratum looks like or get sent to the intersection of the base affine space with the, the pre-image under the high weight map of this open uh, face of the positive vial chamber. Okay, so the next thing to do is I wanna take a toric degeneration of the base affine space to the toric variety X sub C, which is going to be the toric variety associated um, with a semi-group of this extended string cone. So it's an affine toric variety. So it's a theorem originally proved by uh, Philippe Caldero, which is that there's, so there's a flat family from calligraphic X down to C. Um, so that above, um, above non-zero points of C, fibers look like the base affine space. And above the special fiber, so above zero, um, this fiber looks like this toric variety, except C. So maybe a more like modern perspective on this is due to Cave, which is that, so we had the string parameterization, um, which was defined on um, the dual canonical basis, but Cave observed that you can really extend this to evaluation on um, the ring of functions on G mod N, which takes values in, um, P times uh, Z to the N. And so now this is equipped with some total order, which is you have, um, you have the lexical graphical order on here, and then you break ties by a total order on dominant weights, which is refining the like standard um, domination par partial oh. order. What does it mean, evaluation? So this is a, it's a function or a map from here to here, which eats a function and it gives you a point um, and it satisfies some axioms. It satisfies that 
it takes um, a product. So the valuation of F times G is equal to the valuation of F plus the valuation of G. And additionally, the valuation of F plus G is bigger than or equal to bigger than or equal than the minimum of the valuation of f and g of f and the valuation of g so this is some piece of technology from algebraic geo or commutative algebra okay. um, so basic basically i mention it because uh there's this theorem of Calderon, which is i think from the the 90s and there's been a lot of work done on torque degeneration since then and basically there's a machine that if you have a valuation with one dimensional leaves like this there's a way to to use that to give you a torque degeneration um it, i mean it's worth saying here the crucially important reason why we need a valuation right which is to embed things yeah, so I'm going to say that on the next slide. Okay. Yeah. Um, Excuse me, and what is the leaf uh, of the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I guess I, um, I wasn't going to talk about valuations a lot, but now I'll, I'll tell you, um, which is why I didn't write it down. So um, what it means when I say that it has one-dimensional leaves, so I can look at... Um, I can look at the valuation. Uh, I'm going to go to paintbrush right here. So, um, we, um, so let me let me say a less than or equal to k this is the set of points inside or the set of functions inside my algebra right um, such that the valuation of f is less than or equal to k, right? And then a less than k is defined similarly. And when it has, to say that the valuation has one dimensional leaves is to say that this quotient vector space, so a less than or equal to k divided by a less than k, so that the dimension of this is equal to zero or one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's yep. clear. Okay. So I, I guess I didn't want to dwell on it, but mention that there's this reformulation. So we actually do use this, but I'm not gonna talk about it a lot. Basically, we wanna embed this degeneration into E cross C so that um, under this embedding, this map pi, which is this family, um, coincides with just projection to the second factor. Um, so the technical point is that you can choose this embedding in a nice way. So I have this toric variety X sub CI, which I'm thinking is sitting in the, the zero fiber of this uh, degeneration. And it has a torus, which is acting on it. And I can take the compact form of that. And I want to pick this embedding carefully so that um, this torus action extends to an action on E via linear unitary transformations. 
Um, so this will be eventually we want that our um, our this torus action is going to be Hamiltonian. Um, so it's a little bit technical, but the the presence of the valuation lets us do this in like an easy way. And this is using an argument that's due to Harada and Kabe, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, here's an example. So G is SL3 as before. So I said, this is the, the semi-group algebra. I can take this Reis algebra. So this is gonna be the coordinate algebra of my degeneration. And what it looks like is I take polynomials in six variables plus this additional parameter T, which is the coordinate on C. And I'm gonna deform the ideal by just multiplying the last term by T. So um, this is a CT module. If you look at, um, so if you're allowed to invert T, then there's an isomorphism just to uh, CG mod N times uh, C cross. And then above the zero fiber, so, so above zero, so when I, can, when I put T is equal to zero, then this term of the ideal goes to, to zero, and you just recover the semi-group algebra. Uh, Benjamin, maybe something I haven't quite understood yeah. Maybe on some previous slide or previous slides. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this, uh, this, this uh, right, we have our X sitting inside this vector space E, right? Yeah. Now, um, I, I, I don't quite understand why, uh, so, 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 so now we are looking for that torus, but why would it preserve X within, well, why doesn't it move X within E? The torus? Yeah, the, the big torus. But what, the, big, torus, the, the big torus. torus, you mean? Yeah, the big torus, yes. Oh yeah, it will, it will move X inside of E. It just acts on the, the zero fiber. It oh, preserves okay. the zero oh, fiber. It, so, so it does not preserve, okay, okay. No, no, it doesn't preserve X. I mean, if it preserved X, it would also preserve um, the one fiber. So this would just give you a, mm -hmm. A Hamiltonian torus action on G mod n. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so then this is kind of where a lot of the real work comes in is um, building this gradient Hamiltonian flow. So um, I want to build a map from this base affine space G mod n to this toric variety. And I'm gonna work piecewise. So for each, each open face of the positive vial chamber, I wanna restrict attention to this stratum, which is given by the pre-image of this open face under the high weight map, cross C. So this is gonna be smooth away from the zero fiber. Um, I'm gonna define a vector field, which is called the gradient Hamiltonian vector field. Um, so this, the total space of my degeneration, calographic X, this is a, a, I guess each stratum of this is a Kähler manifold. So I can define this vector field, which is some renormalization of the gradient vector field for the real, the, um, the real part of the projection or of this map pi. And it's simultaneously a Hamiltonian vector field for the imaginary part of this map pi. And so the fact that calligraphic X is Kähler gives you that these guys are equal. Um, so you need to worry about if this is well-defined, it's well-defined away from a closed subset of the zero fiber. Um, um, and a crucial fact is that this vector field lies parallel to fibers of the high weight map. So if I embed X into E cross C and project to E and then take this high weight map, which is the moment map for this Tim Torus, 
um, then this gradient Hamiltonian vector field is going to preserve this high weight map. Um, how, how is it? Why, why, why is that? Um, this is essentially just Noether's theorem. So the mm -hmm. um, right the the this torus action is acting um, parallel to fibers of pi, and so due to Noether's theorem, this you basically switch which vector field you're looking at. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not sure I totally understand. So could, 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 could you say again, right? So you, you, you're you saying that, all right, so there is this, uh, there is this, uh, whatever, theme torus, or there is this high weight map, and okay, but well, what, 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 why, why does it, whatever, this uh, theme torus section, why does it preserve, does it preserve the whole of pi, or only imaginary part of pi, or what, what? Um, it preserves, so, so the Tim Torres acts parallel to fibers of pi, right? Okay. So in particular, it acts parallel to fibers of imaginary part of mm -hmm. pi. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, so that the, says, that but says, the, sorry. Yeah. But, but then the, the maximal torus also has this property or not? It does, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so everything that I'm going to say is T equivariant for the maximal torus action of um, K sitting, or of K sitting inside G for the left action of G on here. So it's T equivariant for that maximal torus in there. Additionally, it's also T equivariant for the Tim torus action. Um, the Tim torus action ends up being more important for controlling um, this gradient Hamiltonian vector field just because its moment map is proper. Okay. So um, one of the, the difficult things to show is that, so I've defined these gradient Hamiltonian vector fields piecewise. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take all of them together. So disjoint union, all of them. And I can view this as, so now X is sitting inside um, E cross C. So I can just view this as a section of the tangent bundle of E cross C restricted to X. Um, so it's a technical fact that this is continuous. So it's important to notice that this doesn't always happen for gradient vector fields defined on stratified spaces. So this is an example told to me by Rayer. Um, here's the Whitney umbrella. So you could think of, um, take like the gradient vector field, which is, um, the gradient vector field for projection to the z-axis, where the z-axis is parallel to the handle here of the umbrella. Um, so the gradient vector field on the handle is flowing directly downwards. Um, the gradient vector field along this minimal piece of the sort of fan of the umbrella is going to be zero, and so as you approach into the handle, this will fail to be continuous. Um, so it's something non-trivial that this, this gradient vector field that we construct actually happens to be continuous when you patch it together from its piecewise uh, defined bits. Okay. So the gradient Hamiltonian vector field, if you project down to C, or you map down to C, it projects down to the um, constant vector field, which is flowing to the left with constant speed. Um, so let me call uh, var phi t the, the time t flow of this vector field as long as it's defined. So due to this fact, 
it moves the fiber at time one to the fiber at time one minus t, say. So this is true for t up to one. Um, so this is everywhere that the, uh, the, digit, the total space of the degeneration x is um, trivialized. So some technical facts are that this flow exists and is unique for all these times. So this comes from um, essentially the fact that this flow is preserving this high weight map, which is proper. Um, so a priori, this is some, some flow on some, um, at least piecewise, is on some non-compact spaces. And who knows what happens when you flow along them. Maybe you flow into lower strata. But because you preserve this high weight map, which is proper, you can actually integrate these vector fields. Um, also a technical fact is that the flow itself is continuous as a map from this time one fiber to the time one minus t fiber. And then finally, uh, that this flow preserves the symplectic form um, stratum wise. So this is just due to the fact that it's a Hamiltonian vector field. Um, so then this is, the next thing to do is to show that this uh, gradient Hamiltonian flow can be extended to a continuous map um, from the one fiber to the zero fiber. And this is using basically an argument of Harada and Kaveh, um, which is using this famous gradient inequality by uh, Voy, uh, this Polish guy with an name that I can't pronounce. Um, anyways, so restrict when you restrict to uh, G mod N intersected with one of these uh, pre-images of an open face of the positive vial chamber, so on one of these strata, this is a sum smooth symplectic isomorphism on an open dense subset of this guy, of this symplectic manifold. So then finally to like put everything together, um, we have this chain of maps. So from step two, we can identify the imploded cotangent bundle with uh, the base affine space, G mod n. Take this time one gradient Hamiltonian flow, which I constructed, and it's a map from G mod n to this torque variety. There's a compact torus acting on this, and the action is Hamiltonian. And I take the moment map image of that, and it turns out that the moment map image is just the real cone um, spanned by the uh, semi-group algebra of this torque variety. And this is sitting, just sitting inside Rn. Um, so, so, yep. so just a question. So uh, is it still on XCI? Is it still stratified? Or there we have a global T, uh, T action for the same big torus? Uh, so you do have a global, I mean, X is, XCI is a, an affine variety which isn't smooth, mm -hmm. but you do have like an algebraic action of the torus of the toric variety on the toric variety. So the torus action is defined everywhere. Um, you just have to look at the... Um, essentially the, the smooth loci of, um, to interpret the, the moment map as being the Hamiltonian for this torus action. Does uh, that make sense? Oh, so, 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 so the moment map, you, you say it's only for the smooth part? Um, so you can define the moment map everywhere. You can define the moment map everywhere, but then, I mean, moment map involves taking derivatives, so it will only satisfy the moment map condition when it is actually smooth. Yeah, yeah, but, but stratum wise, it is, isn't there the same story that you would have strata and on each stratum, you, you, you can still restrict your moment map and then some derivatives will be defined or it, it does not make sense? 
is at the moment I'm defined everywhere on the ambient vector space. Yes, yes. Yeah, so each, so there's a stratification of this torque variety, which is indexed by faces of the positive vial chamber. It's not the case that on a given, say the stratum over the open face of the positive vial chamber, um, this entire thing will not be smooth, but there's an open dense subset of it, which is smooth, right? And there you can like make sense of the moment map condition. And for other strata? And for other, yeah, sure. For other strata, you just restrict. And um, the moment map, I mean, it'll either be, certain components of the moment map will be constant. And then the other ones will be smooth on an open dense subset. But how is it also those moment maps for tori, they are not uniquely defined, right? So you also choose some, um, uh, right, some, some, some constants. So as everything map, yeah, 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 sure. But you can, they're uniquely defined by up to some like, I guess some reparameterization, so some, some automorphism of your torus and some just like affine shift. And you can fix the, fix it so that, um, so there's a, a unique point sitting over the vertex of the positive valve chamber inside this torque variety, and you just impose that this scent gets sent to the vertex of this cone. But you have this Tim torus acting on the ambient vector space, and you, you just take the moment map for that linear action, and you just restrict it to this affine variety. Isn't that what is happening? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, so you yeah you have a you have a torus action on the ambient vector space, and you can write down a moment map for it, in sort of a standard way, and then you just restrict to the torque variety. Does that answer your question, Anton? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, right. So. I should try and finish up. But um, anyways, to finish up, essentially it's just that this map out of uh, the imploded cotangent bundle descends to a map out of little k star, which is just, which is then the moment map that we desired from the beginning. Um, okay, so then the last thing to say is that, um, just in regard to these things called collective integrable systems. So if M is a compact connected Hamiltonian K manifold, um, say that M is multiplicity free if all the reduced spaces are zero dimensional. So an integrable system on M is called collective if its moment map is of the form or you, you take the moment map of M to little k star, and then you compose with a map out of little k star. So it's a question, I, I think going back to Gelman and Sternberg in 83, of to construct collective integrable torus actions on um, Hamiltonian k manifolds. So then the theorem is that if you have a compact connected Hamiltonian K manifold, the composition of, um, oh, okay, so I've, I've switched the mu and the phi here. So here M should be, I should take the moment map to little k star and then um, this map mu, which is the one that I constructed a couple of slides ago, this generalized gelfand setlin system. So the composition of these two maps is continuous, proper, smooth on an open dense subset of M and generates a Hamiltonian torus action on that smooth locus. Um, so if M is multiplicity free, then the dimension of this torus is 
sufficiently large to give a completely integrable system on an open dense subset of M, which is the smooth locus of this composition. So the, the proof of this is basically you take a map from M, there's uh, something called the symplectic contraction of M, which is uh, a stratified space, which is a diagonal reduction of the symplectic implosion of M with the imploded cotangent bundle. Um, this is a, so this is a stratified space which has an open dense subset, which is a smooth symplectic manifold. This map is a symplectomorphism um, on an open dense subset. Um, you take a map from the symplectic contraction to this space, which is just the identity, descends from the identity on the first component and is this um, time one gradient Hamiltonian flow on the second component. And then you take the moment map out of, out of that. Um, so, right, so this is, when you put all the commuting diagrams together, this is basically how the moment map out of M looks like when you compose with this um, generalized Gelfand-Satlin system that we've constructed. And this gives you a completely integrable torus action on um, the subset of M, which is, uh, for which this map is smooth. Okay, so sorry, I, I feel like I messed up the timing a little bit, but that's all I wanted to say, so thanks. Well, thank you. So, um, so, uh, any questions or comments? Well, yeah, any questions or comments, please? Benjamin? Yeah. Uh, this is a stupid question about these gradient Hamiltonian vector fields. I've uh, uh, still have a hard time um, imagining that. A Hamiltonian vector field preserves the volume form. Okay, but a gradient vector field uh, almost never does that, say near a minimum. A gradient vector field will always contract uh, the space towards the minimum. So, yet here we have this uh, vector field which is simultaneously a gradient and a symplectic vector field. Um. Yeah, what's your question? Uh, I guess it's, the, it's not a question, it's more like a, a stupid remark. So yeah. it, 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 this, this vector field cannot have minima. It cannot, uh, it, yeah. Uh, open, open total lattice does the same thing. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, but, but, but how is it, the, is it the explanation that this function pi, right? So the, the vector field moves uh, along kind of from one fiber of pi to the other fiber and pi never has any whatever minimum or maximum or anything, right? Is it? Is yeah. That... yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that must be it. Oh, I don't know. Like, it's... Mm. No, I, I think this must be it. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, I may, may I again repeat the question of the previous time. So, 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 so this integrable system, right, is generalized Gelfand cycling. It turns out that uh, it works for this collective. There is this phenomenon of collective variables. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Uh, it does define circle actions or whatever, torus actions on multiplicity free spaces, or actually probably on any, on any, um, uh, Hamiltonian K space. Now, do you understand why? What's the what's what's the nature of it? What's the property which ensures that this uh, uh, integrable system is so good? Um, um, I mean, I guess maybe just that it's built out of an out of an integrable system on 
gmod n. I mean, isn't this, this is like the problem for collective variables normally is that um, you can have a map to little k star, but maybe it doesn't factor through a map to mm -hmm. um, gmod n. So something about the, the Tim Torres action. Probably, probably. Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's that it's, we've really built it on gmod n and then took everything as descending from there rather than just working purely on little k star. Okay, so so maybe then coming back to, 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 to that question about the orthogonality of the basis, right? I, I guess it's related to, to the following idea that now we can try to bore Sommerfeld quantize, right? Yeah. And if we bore Sommerfeld quantize a priori, the integral points of the uh, of the polytops or, or the string cone or, or this whatever extended string cone, they will correspond to non-intersecting uh, Lagrangian submanifolds, namely those, those fibers will be just copies of this big torus. They yeah. don't intersect. And so normally the corresponding uh, vectors in yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hilbert space, they should be orthogonal. And, and how it goes with the possibly non-orthogonal uh, vectors of the canonical basis from which we started. What, what's the kind of... So, yeah, so the explanation is something like this. So the functions... Mm -hmm. Right, so we want to... We want to embed this guy in X into here. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically we're going to do it in such a way we wanted to do it so that, um, the compact torus of the toric variety is acting via unitary transformations on E. Um, so, right. So if you think about how this embedding goes, you need to choose some basis for um, this vector space E. And what we're not going to do is just pick the dual canonical basis and use that as like our coordinates on E. What we are going to do is we're going to pick a system of coordinates on E, which are orthogonal and also which um, basically have the right image under the valuation. So um, if you think of the dual canonical basis, it's, it's a basis of E and you hit it with a string valuation and you get some, some points. Um, we're gonna pick a basis of E which gets sent to those same points under the valuation and is additionally orthogonal. Um, so that amounts, like in this picture where I've written down the Riesz algebra and I've now degenerated to the semi-group algebra. Um, in this particular example, these guys are all weight vectors, so they're automatically orthogonal. But in general, I'm going to pick coordinates. I'm going to pick a way to do this so that these coordinates are all orthogonal. And then when you... Um, this like binomial ideal is going to be in terms of orthogonal coordinates after you de degenerate. Mm. Uh, so okay. it's like it's like a question of embedding your the total space of your degeneration carefully into E cross C. Um, but that's that's a proposal of an answer, or is it an answer? It's an answer. Yeah. So this is. Um, if you look at the paper of Harada Kave, um, they ran into a similar issue, and basically they they have some um, clever way of picking this this orthogonal basis, which involves using this valuation. So the fact that you have this valuation lets you basically inductively. Um, pick an orthogonal basis that has the right image under the valuation. Mm 
Is it some kind of, uh, is it, but then if it's inductive, is it some kind of Gram Schmidt of the? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically you're, you're ordering your, so you order your dual canonical basis according to your valuation, and then you just do Gram Schmidt like using that ordering. Mm -hmm. um, okay, perfect. Yeah.